There was no internet at the time. I know somebody else. Just slap me if I fucking say that again. And what about... <laughs> You've got to remember there was no internet at the time. Oh, we'd have to do everything without the internet. Oh, no mobile phones. Perhaps more than anything else, modern Britain has been defined by the styles and sounds of its streets. The way we dress and the music that soundtracks our lives is far more than just a matter of personal taste. It can be a reaction, a movement, a statement from an entire generation. From mods to skins, suede heads to punks, soul boys to ravers, junglists, indie kids, emos and grime crews. The history of our time is basically the history of its youth cults. These style subcultures have been iconised and bastardised by the mainstream, scapegoated by the media and appropriated by the high street. Yet somehow, we still keep producing these strange and beautiful movements. But how did this epochal journey from the bedroom to the boardroom come about? How did a few British kids, trying to look a bit different, come to impact culture in the way it did? How did our stylish nation take over the world? Stooge Story Volume 1, I remember getting that, that was £5 at the time, but it's got everything on it. I paid £30 for that. That's probably what my week's wages was in 1983. My earliest pictures would have been taken before this sort of mid-80s mod explosion happened. That's why I shot in black and white film, because we wanted it to make it look 60s, but, you know, other than the cars and the number plates, you could easily believe that's 1964, not 1984. When the Mod Revival came out, I kind of liked it, but I was too young. I couldn't go to clubs. I was living sort of away from most places. And then in 1982, I was 17, got my first scooter. So I went to my first mod club, and I remember going along and being terrified. I didn't know anything. It's the first time I'd ever seen anyone on amphetamines. And I remember going, there was like this, this Asian guy in a boating blazer, and he just kept repeating the same thing over and over. And I was just like, all right, mate, you know, there's no need for that. And then obviously I realised that what we'd done was taken speed. But going back then, we thought that there was some sort of code and the world would be mod shaped. Nineteen eighty, a year zero for British youth culture. This was the first time that young people considered the styles and sounds that came before them. It was a divided time in which the ideological lines of Labour and Tory seemed to tear the nation apart. And within these divisions, the youth of Britain seemed determined to divide even further. At the dawn of this new decade, it was the mod revivalists who were making the most noise. Yeah, I'm still a mod. I'll always be a mod. You can bury me a mod. This was a culture of young people who looked not towards their own bleak future, but to the early 1960s in order to create a new hybrid of mod and skinhead. This time, standing shoulder to shoulder with the second generation black and Asian kids they'd grown up next door to in the new urbanised Britain. up already. <laughs> oh, that sounds a bit slow. This is Gwen Owens. It's a record called Wanted and Needed. And it's, uh, I think it's one of the all-time favourites. When I was about 14, we'd all sneaked in to see Quadrophenia. Anyway, I saw, I saw this thing on the screen come alive and, and recognise what it was as mod. I went into Bury one day and went in the bookshop and there was a book there by a guy called Richard Barnes. I remember being so excited and so inspired because I just thought, God, these kids look so cool. And they were original 60s mods. And then I got more refined about it and started working out what mods would wear. So I was like so obsessed with the sort of look of it all. The appeal to me was something different that was probably about meeting kids that weren't from your school or they weren't from your town. Kids from my background were being bred to get on the production line and you'd probably end up in, you know, overalls or something. You didn't want to go out at the weekend and, and look scruffy. The punk ethos did not appeal to me. The idea of having, like, dirty air and filthy clothes was like, I can't look like that, I've got to look clean. See me walking around. Coming out of the mob revival from the 79 period to the early 80s, you had a diversion of the mob movement. We're going out of a street tribe, which was, you know, Parker Boys, etc., into pure authenticity, a purist look at mod, looking back directly 20 years before. We were following this style that was perfection of mod. <laughs>
If you think of like the mod revival parkers and Carnaby Street gear, you know, the cheapo stuff, that's not what you would call having just a kind of a peacock male. You can't be a peacock and a parker. You've got to start to tailor yourself up because you look at the guys in that club and they're all starting to wear tailored gear. By 85, this group of guys and girls, they start to think, well, we're different from those people that call themselves mods. We've started to be known as stylists. That's when the, the movement splits totally. We had tailors in Carnaby Street, we had our own personal tailors all around London. And we were all the same, we were all mad. We were the first people to really go back and take the image from the 60s and try and get that authenticity. Much like the clothes, the soundtrack to this new multiracial, politicised young Britain also came from a different era. Scar, an infectious Jamaican pop sound that had been popular with the first wave of skinheads, was resurrected with a punk twist, as bands like The Specials and Madness captured hearts and minds with their tight haircuts and moon stomp rhythms. Rude Boys was, was like a cult thing in Jamaica in the mid-60s where people dressed really slick and they were like criminals, you know, it was like underground violence. But I mean, it was just a fashion. We all needed an identity, I mean, the music and the clothes, but I mean, with the label, it's, it's a stronger thing, it's, it's a whole movement. Being rude was a sense of style, but a sense of attitude. It's looking as best as you possibly can with whatever you possibly got. Post-World War II, you have every strata within Jamaican society which came over. You have regular folks, you have rude boys, and it was these men and women with their visual impact in terms of how they were dressed, how they would walk, how they would be, which became the influence on British disenfranchised youth looking at these other young people who are coming over and who are cutting the best kind of swag that they'd ever seen. In the early 60s, the young modernists would see these black guys at a dance and would want to emulate their style because they were doing something that was completely fresh. They took an essence of what Rude Boys were doing. People wanted to replicate this newness, which was being put together in a way that British kids weren't putting it together. In the late 70s and in the early 80s, there was a lot of political unrest, but bands like The Selector and The Specials stood for something which was black and white coming together. And the whole term two-tone was about the two cultures getting together. Bands like that would reference Rude Boy in their lyrics and Rude Boy in their attitude and Rude Boy in the way that they would dress. Bands like The Specials and The Selector were very much about people getting together and supporting and sharing music and culture. Here it is, 1972. Extremely knackered, but that's because it's been used a lot. Originally, when the special started out, we were kind of like a punk band and a reggae band. So we play, we play a punk song and we play a reggae song. And it was like they were two separate bands and, and it could have didn't work. And it was the same with how we looked. Whereas with Scar, it unified the music and it unified the image as well. Punk had a very specific image. It was that whole DIY ethic. But we were sort of like, okay, well, let's not do it like that. And so we looked back to the mod ethic of the, of the 60s. If you like, it was, it was ready-made for me. It's like, well, okay, this is what people used to wear back then. This is what the specials will wear now. You could buy a second-hand tonic suit, loads of them, because all the old mods had all got too fat or decided not to be mods anymore. And that followed Jerry, Joe Danner's vision of um, recycling, of sort of using sort of second-hand stuff. This is the uh, wardrobe, all second-hand gear, very nice. Nice piece of mo hands. <laughs> 
Linval um, didn't like that idea at all. You know, um, me now wear dead man clothes, you know. So he, he went out and got the tonic suits actually made. Don't know where he got the money from. We toured with The Clash for three weeks. I remember a very memorable show at Crawley Leisure Centre where an awful lot of skinheads travelled to see The Clash. The, the overwhelming presence was like turned up Levi's, Doc Martens, Ben Sherman's, and a nasty attitude. And we realised that this was going to be our target audience, so I think there was a conscious effort to look a bit like them so we could appeal to them. It's funny because when I was growing up, these were the people who would, you know, in intimidate the hell out of me at sort of youth club discos. To think that I was then sort of looking like a skinhead was kind of ironic at, at best. <laughs>
really want to wear these little skirts and twin sets which a lot of the girls wore. In between I was thinking I really like that skinhead look. You know, tonic suits and loafers and amazing Ben Shermans and Brutus and JTEX. So that really appealed to me. There they go, pride and jail. Ben Sherman from sort of 69. Absolutely perfect. Nice little candy stripe. I've got quite a few nice shirts. This one's my favourite. I love big collars and bright colours. One of my favourite suits, just because that cloth, it's just superb. These are original 69 monkey boots, popular with the girls because they couldn't get DM small enough. So that's really loud. Um, I've not had balls big enough to wear one yet. <laughs> I'll show you my socks, like all 60s socks. You can't wear original clothes and not have original socks, can you? got into soul music from my dad at about 16 and then I took it a little bit further delving into it and getting passionate then I progressed and thought I want to be a skinhead so I just really really took it to a different level just passionate and maybe a bit crackers as you can see with my house. In the 1980s many working class kids came from families with a keen political awareness. Socialism and unions were an absolute reality for people raised for the production line. The youth were politicised, but not necessarily represented. In the absence of a real voice, some relied on the voice of resentment found on the far right. A crude comic book interpretation of politics was afforded from groups such as the British Movement and the National Front. Are you political? We're a national, national, front. national Front. We're all National Front. You're all National Front, why? Majority, majority. Because because we're like like niggas. They don't belong here. There is something about Wickham. It did have a very strong gang contingent compared with other towns. It was only 35, 34 miles away from London, but it might as well have been on the fucking moon. And if you're going to get the whole 50s social engineering of just going, let's dump a load of fucking war-traumatised people, Irish immigrants, West Indian immigrants, into these fucking towns, and let's just leave them there. And then they're tearing lumps out of each other, and they're getting politicised by the time they're 14, 15. There was an energy that attracted us from the extreme, a lot of kids from grew up in children's homes. It blossomed like mushrooms. And there was only negative press. All those fucking journalists must have just fanked each other off. Yeah, skinheads. Yeah. So you're sitting there with all your friends and you're in this incredibly vibrant culture, the black and white kids coming together for the first time. And then we get it's getting demonized for Nazism, which is just fucking fantastic. You know, the thing about being a skinhead was. Everyone was a wanker. The Nazis, the left, we all of them. I went to a Desmond Decker concert and he came on stage and suddenly this group of dodgy skinheads started Z-Kyling. And I remember just feeling ashamed that if anyone looked at me and thought, she's a skinhead, she's into that, I was like, I'm not doing this. You got all these people with this kind of NF attitude. It just spoiled it. <laughs> Skinheads fell into a negative caricature of themselves. The increasingly fractured, mod revivalists and the two-tone rude boys converged into one amorphous youth tribe, the Scooter Boys. I'm a Scooter lad, right? And I belong in Scooter land. But what united them was a fascination for the Italian scooters now gathering rust in the sheds of pensions. They were available on the cheap, and they offered a new autonomy and independence to a generation that felt hemmed in. Soon, scooter runs started popping up around the country offering acceptance to kids that wouldn't have been seen or heard at Glastonbury. This is a uh, LI Lambretta 150 Special. People say they're unreliable, but they were, they've always been unreliable. That's the fun of having a Lambretta. I mean, these were just a cheap form of transport, but with the Italians, the way they style and design everything, it, it just become an icon. When the Northern Mod come out, they were sort of a mixture of the mods the skinheads, everything, and we just loved it. Jean jackets, Dr. Martins. We wanted in, thinking, hang on, we can ride scooters and not look like mods. And that's where the scooter boy sort of evolved. For me, I think it, it was a way out. You, you know, when you come from a working class family, just getting away from your mum and dad, you know, constantly arguing. Every rally was like a party. 
1984, Isle of Wight, you're talking over 20,000 scooters then. This was before a lot of the big festivals. You would just look on the top of the hill and it looked like Glastonbury basically. It was the nearest you'll ever get to freedom of doing exactly what you like. On a Saturday on a bank holiday, it's quite common to see really hundreds of scooters. It's an amazing thing to see, an amazing smell, an amazing noise. Of course, you sort of brought up feeling a bit trapped. So they're seeing these kids giving this kind of first sense of freedom. It's incredibly romantic. That idea was kind of made more romantic by the names of the scooter clubs. So you've got like, things like Dolly Hunters, and Gullit the Ghoul Gladiators, the Scunthorpe Road Rats. A lot of kind of uh, very heroic names, you know, or some sort of freedom. Even though everything broke down every 10 miles, they'd want that free. <laughs> The scooters I always love are Lambrettas. The ones I still love the most now, these kind of sort of homemade custom scooters, really. And it was all about trying to make them go faster and failing terribly, you know. We just did lots of videos in shanted garages and grinders and made his dad's hammer. He was trying to make something that had been engineered beautifully and worked perfectly well. Go eight miles an hour faster than just ruining it. It got to this point where bad manners seemed to be playing at every rally. I went to a rally and there was a Vespa tug of war on a piece of grass. You think, that's really not why I'm going to scooters. You know, <laughs> you watch two fat fellas pissed doing a Vespa tug of war. It definitely changed. That was its downfall because everybody was welcome. It brought a lot of the wrong people in and you had sort of the right wing start to get in there. Kids just were lost. People blame the blacks like they blame the Polish now. It was any excuse, but we were listening to black music. We were dancing to Scar. You know, you're contradicting yourself. I think they were just rebelling for the sake of rebelling. People like me and a lot of people who have been in it since 1980, we're still doing exactly what we did in them days. We're still drinking and partying and thinking we're 19 years old. I've noticed even the two-tone and the scar scene now getting very big, the skinhead scene getting big. The scooter scene is now the biggest it's ever been. Mm. You know, it's got more commercial, but it's good for me. I work on them, so, you know, I'm not going to turn anybody's money down. <laughs> do you know what I mean? <laughs> As we arrive in the mid-80s, a generation of working-class kids who had been rejected by Glastonbury and Genesis, yet found acceptance in the second-hand culture of the 60s, had finally worn out their airway. All scenes begin to stale eventually, and this one was no different. British youth has always had the ability to reinvent itself. The style obsessives had begun to look for new inspiration, and they found it in the bright decadent scenes that were brewing in Milan, the Bronx and Ibiza. So much you 